Okay. Thanks for the questions, and uh, we have a couple of them that are similar, so I'm going to throw those out to you uh, first. Uh, they both have to do with uh, uh, the, the authority question of Scripture. Uh, one is that uh, some secular, uh, excuse me, wow, speaking of Freudian slips, uh, some scholars claim... <laughs> Wow. Some scholars claim faithfulness in their interpretation, yet come to results uh, that are, uh, uh, I can't read the word, that, that are not consistent with traditional belief uh, or orthodoxy. For example, uh, Christ is not the only way to salvation, or marriage is not necessarily between a man and a woman. And they ask, what is your comment? And I'll hold that thought for just a second. And then the second one regarding authority, I think, or at least how we read the text, is how do the Gospels reveal the realities of atonement? So uh, both of those questions to me are authority questions. What is your understanding of the authority of Scripture in regard to those? And the second one was how do the Gospels, I guess this is referring uh, specifically to Jonathan, how do the Gospels reveal the realities of the atonement? Or I would say, which theory of the atonement, perhaps. So there you go. Uh, Y'all want to take on that question, those questions? And there's the mic. Well, or not. <laughs> okay, on, on the authority of Scripture, you can come to non-traditional views, but still believe in the authority of Scripture. Um, I know, uh, I mean, like, like it's, 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 it's a very hairy topic, but let's take the issue of sexuality. I know there are Christians who take a, what you might call a non-traditional view of family and sexuality, and they believe they can find uh, things within scripture that either lead to a trajectory uh, that would you know, make same-sex relationships normative, or they interpret the cultural world of the apostles in such a way as to say what Paul is uh, rallying against is different from what we're dealing with in our context. So, strictly speaking, it is possible to hold to biblical authority and accept non-traditional interpretations. Uh, that doesn't mean those non-traditional interpretations are not uh, incorrect, or it doesn't mean they might have some harmful consequences. But then you'll get other scholars and, um, uh, who will say things like, well, you know, Paul was just a sexist, homophobic bigot. Who gives a damn what he thinks? Uh, that is probably fl playing, you know, a little bit more loose with things like biblical authority. And that's, <laughs> there are some more serious questions what you then have to do, the whole idea of Christianity, of a revealed religion, and how you live that out. So I, I don't think necessarily biblical authority is disregarded simply because you come to a non-traditional interpretation. There can be some other problems and there can be some other symptomatic problems underneath, but it's not necessarily an immediate affront to biblical authority. Anyone else to add to that? I really like what Mike, what you just said and also what you said earlier about really the Holy Spirit being the source of authority as opposed to the printed words on the page. Um, and I, I also would agree that um, with, with what you said that one can come to non-traditional views uh, while still taking scripture and the authority of scripture very seriously, but it might be a somewhat different hermeneutic model. Um, I, in my own reading, am influenced by what I would call a kind of loose version of the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which insists on the primacy of scripture, yet also says that we don't ever read scripture in a vacuum and that we are always also influenced by other sources of authority, including um, tradition, um, including experience, and including um, reason, or what sometimes gets broadened out to, uh, to, to be encompass secular knowledge. Um, and so I think, for example, on the issue of sexuality, when one takes these other kinds of factors into account, 
and recognizes that we cannot even read scripture apart from in some some measure of influence from these others and that that is okay that that is appropriate that this is also how God speaks to us in the world uh, then that allows us to come to interpretations that may not be traditional and I also think too that the lens of history is helpful here as we look back at the at the abolitionist period and the ways that tradition taught that slavery was okay um, and that the uh, subjugation of people of color was fine. In fact, there's authorization for it right there in scripture. And yet uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit moved across the land and through, uh, through people's experience and reason, uh, it began to be seen that this really was not uh, necessarily the way that God wanted society to be ordered. So when I look at those kinds of historic examples, that also has influence on the way I and um, others with whom I work try to come to evaluation of some of these very difficult issues. Unless you want to go on, I'll, I'll happily... No, please. Not to set my foot in the bear trap. Um, <clears throat> Two things come to mind in regard to scriptural authority, we're really just kind of going in a different direction from these two excellent uh, responses. The first is, since the question I think was framed in regard to same-sex marriage and, help me out, what was the other? Uh, oh, it, it, uh, hot button topics. It doesn't matter, uh, Pastor Jester. Oh, uh, is Christ the only uh, way, to way to salvation? That's right. Yeah. Um, but, it always disturbs me that these questions are raised and discussed um, often by, and I'm certainly not saying this about the person who wrote this uh, down, but often without a parallel commitment uh, to living under the authority of Scripture where it is absolutely clear, uh, or in every aspect. So, I mean, I, I've actually spent a lot of time, I've never really published now, but thinking about same-sex issues in the church and, and what is the response that, what is the, the best response that we could take forward as a Christian church to maximize wholeness and minimize harm. Um, but uh, those who rage on that controversy uh, might then look at, you know, read, read past a thousand verses about charity and caring for the poor and looking after uh, uh, the marginalized brother I mean, on both sides uh, of this debate and not invest their energies in doing them. So part of me, the, the, the petulant part of me, wants to say, well, what's the point of talking about scriptural authority if you're not going to conform your life in the first place to those parts that are just undisputable? And that gets us back to the canon within the canon. We all have our fam favorite authoritative text. I shouldn't say all, many of us do. Yes. John, Jonathan and I agree that the gospels are the canon within the canon. That's why us Anglicans, we stand when we read the gospels. And uh, that's right, because we stand because this is where you hear the gospel of our salvation. And after the Gospels are read, uh, the, the celebrant, the reader says, this is the Gospel of the Lord, and everyone says, thanks be to Lord Christ. So I'm very happy to have a Gospel within the, Gospels that can within the canon. You agree with me, Jonathan? I do. People will just give me grief about that phrase, but uh, that's yeah. okay, yeah. Well, this could be a new stage <laughs> in Anglican Baptist relations. <laughs> right here, and the, the, this was the day the Anglicans and the Baptists got back together. Just got to introduce you guys to an Episcopacy, scene, I'll be good. Jonathan, do you have anything to say about the question of uh, is there any uh, clarity in the Gospels when it comes to atonement theory? Yeah, I mean, at, at the most general level, I, I have been struck as I continue to say the Gospels that um, any reading that does not focus on Jesus' saving death, so we need to talk more detail what atonement means, but for sure, Jesus' saving death and resurrection are the the apex of the gospel story. And it's amazing how often that is lost. I mean, Dale Allison's one person who's always pointed this out, I think, well. Um, but I, I always think of it like um, when Elmer Fudd is chasing Bugs Bunny and the jar of ether is opened and then they're moving really slow, right? Come back here. That That's what it feels like uh, when you're reading the gospels is that 
you know, it, it's amazingly fast until you get to the Passion Week, and then the whole thing slow way down. Um, and that's one of the ways in which it, you feel the significance of Jesus' final week, his suffering, death, and resurrection. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's hinted at, it's said explicitly. So that's at least where we need to start to say any gospel that is not, has at its core Jesus' death and resurrection, I would say is not a gospel's gospel or a Pauline gospel for that matter either. Um, so that's that. But then the question of what is ex the exact nature of the atonement is certainly a, a double click into that. And I don't think the gospels do much deep theological reflection on that. I think your best, the other thing that's struck me about Jesus' death in the gospels is that the theology of it is actually found in the Last Supper. So it's not, when you actually look at the passion and crucifixion accounts, there's all, they're very short, very brief. There's no theological exposition there. The theological exposition of the death occurs the night before in the, in the Last Supper pericopi. And those are very interesting. And even there, you don't have full detailed atonement theory, but you certainly have some, I think, some kind of substitutionary um, Jesus is giving his blood for the life of others. So I, I would say, I mean, of course, that's a traditional reading, and I think it comes from the Gospels. In my opinion. Anybody else on that? Sue? I can answer best from Mark and Luke, which are the two Gospels that I've looked at this um, in regard to. I would say that I, I actually maybe disagree a bit. I, I do think there's more there about views of, of um, soteriology in the Gospels. Um, I might not confine it even just to the Last Supper or the Passion narrative, but suggest that there are pieces of uh, sort of behind the, the, the behind the scenes frameworks that by which the evangelists are making sense of the meaning of Jesus' death and resurrection, which are sort of playing out from beginning excuse me, from beginning to end of these narratives. Um, I, I probably would want to argue that um, it's not strictly a, a, a vision of substitutionary atonement, but rather that there is a multiplicity of approaches to soteriology in the early church. Um, in Luke, for example, I would suggest that one could argue for a kind of um, liberation from bondage to Satan model um, of, of soteriology. So in the transfiguration narrative in Luke, uh, only in Luke, when Jesus is discussing with Moses and Elijah uh, his death, it's, it, Luke says in Greek, it's not there in most English translations, that he was discussing the exodus that he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Usually that gets translated euphemistically as the departure. But my argument is, okay, do, he's talking to Moses. Okay, Moses knows what an exodus is, right? So an exodus means taking someone out of bondage. And in fact, I think Luke understands that this is an, a release from bondage to Satan. And that then gets echoed and played out also in the, um, in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, in Mark, I would say there is something kind of like substitutionary atonement, but I don't really see it as, um, it's, it, a lot hinges on what we make of the wrath the wrath of God. Is Jesus bearing wrath that God puts upon him? Or rather, I would say, is Jesus uh, voluntarily submitting himself as one who makes a vicarious sacrifice? And God then recognizes that this is one who is tried and true and accepts that sacrifice as an atoning sacrifice. So I, I do think there's stuff there, but it's kind of subtle and you really have to pull it out. Yeah, thank you for that. I actually, I actually agree. I think there are many ways in which soteriology is, is uh, depicted. I mean, I was just speaking to the atonement issue particularly, but I would add also to those good things you've said. Uh, kingdom is obviously God restoring his way of being in the world and an invitation to human flourishing. I mean, I, that's what's really been struck me as I've spent the last couple of years thinking, reading a lot in virtue ethics is seeing that I think Jesus is really offering the, his own answer to the great human question of how does one flourish the, and with the Sermon on the Mount and other places. So, and, and the healings, I think, are very, very significant in the Gospels, not just as pictures of Jesus' compassion, which they are, but also as they're proleptic. They're, they're a picture of, of freedom from bondage, freedom from death. So I agree, all those are many of the sociological things that are being unpacked. So, yeah. yeah. Either one of you Okay. All right. <laughs> this is a general question. I'm doing these in the order I received them for the most part. So if you brought one, that's what we're doing. 
Uh, you've discussed how to read the New Testament, but the question is how do we make the Bible inviting to a post-Christian world? And I know, so you address that quite a bit. Uh, how to read the Bible in the 21st century, or how to read the New Testament, is meaningless unless we get people to read it. Do um, you have any solutions that you can all retire by suggesting? How do, you get, how, how do you get people to read the Bible more? One of the things I like to do uh, is explain to people, because uh, people say, well, you're religious, therefore you're stupid and ignorant and prejudiced. And uh, I say, really? Well, how about that? And I ask, them a number of, I ask them a number of questions. And I said, can you tell me what John Milton's poem, Paradise Lost, is about? And they go, no. I so, said, do you know what Da Vinci's painting Madonna on the Rocks is about? They go, uh, no. Uh, in, in Australia, the Labour Party has an annual lecture. It's a very important political lecture called the City on a Hill speech given by the political leader. Do you know where that name City on a Hill comes from? And they go, uh, no. Uh, have you ever seen that episode of The Simpsons where, where there's a big fight in the town between the... Uh, between the Irish and the Orange men, and Lisa says, it always comes down to consubstantiation or versus transubstantiation. <laughs> Do you have any idea what she's talking about? And they go, no. So let me get this right. Because you don't know the Bible, you cannot understand literature, art, politics, or even the Simpsons. And you're calling me the ignorant one? Embrace Mike. I <laughs> know uh, this is this is this is Mike Bird with law. Um, so I point out that the the Bible has been at the forefront of Western culture, and there are universities now who have stopped teaching courses on Milton because the students have never read Genesis or the Temptation. They just have no idea what's being talked about, and um, you, you can see this the way some you know uh, language gets gets used wrongly. Uh, in culture where they bring out sort of you know Christian themes every now and then uh, what was that horrible one there was a horrible one of how, how the baby Jesus was baptized in the Jordan think about it for a second the baby Jesus now Jesus was baptized in the Jordan but not when he was a baby and th these are the kind of things you're, you're getting in you're getting in culture now so um, I can tell people to read the Bible because if you don't you are a, a cultural, artistic, and polygonal ignoramus. And that usually motivates them a little bit. Anyone care to follow that? I'm going to take a different tack. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually not going to talk about how to reach uh, adult postmodernist uh, people, because I think that's an incredibly important topic, yet uh, I feel called to, to address something a little different, and that's the question of our children. I started out with that um, passage or the summary of the Christian Smith book on um, soul searching. I think we're doing, even in the church, a terrible job of bringing our children up in the faith. Um, and I think that we have to start with our kids, and that means modeling for them. That means reading scripture so that they see that we do it. It means conversing with them in, in terms that they can understand and entertaining their questions and not ever conveying any kind of judgment against them. It means being active in our churches to make sure that we do have excellent children's education programs and that they're not just learning moralistic therapeutic deism in church or in the, in the, in the children's sermon. Um, and it means uh, taking our kids to church on Sunday. I, my kids laugh because I tell them, I've told them so many times, I took them to church every Sunday because when they got to be adults, I wanted them to feel a visceral surge of guilt if they weren't in church. Um, and guess what? It's kind of worked. Um, so not to say that they haven't, uh, and I, I guess one more thing to that, that that I think has worked well just in, in among some families that I know, is a kind of willingness to uh, not, be, not be afraid of difficult questions um, so that our children know that they can have a critical thinking faith. Because the word out there on the street, the word out there at the two high schools that my daughters attended in Louisville, Kentucky, is exactly what Mike said, that Christians are stupid and they're... Um, they're, they're um, bad for a number of other reasons. They're conservative and they're, they're just not with it. And so they get dismissed. And so 
you have to help children kind of be, if you will, inoculated against that, uh, but also um, have the intelligence and critical capacity for thought to be able to respond to and listen to these kinds of critiques and have some kind of non, um, not non sort of reactive, but intelligent and inviting response so that they can um, engage their peers and in any case, at least themselves, continue in their lives as faithful disciples. Thank you. I would just add to that. I mean, I think of, uh, I, I think preaching and teaching from the Bible that shows that it's very relevant to real life, which means being a student of both one's own soul and culture, so that when you're teaching and preaching from the Bible, it's, uh, it's really practical and within my broader tradition I think someone who does this really well is Tim Keller who's a PCA pastor in Manhattan I mean he's really made the Bible very relevant to the Manhattan crowd which is not an easy one to do but he's it's from teaching from the Bible um, in a way that is very sensitive to culture and I think that's done a lot of good in my opinion anything um, one of the Aside from Mike's excellent point, seriously, because if you want to succeed as an English major in college, you need to know the Bible. That's the re reason I graduated with my BA. I knew the Bible, so I could always write a paper on something, on Milton or something. But aside from that, what really motivates people to read Scripture? I'm guessing that one strong motivation is um, suddenly they, they're really presented with Jesus. Um, not, not. I mean, not, I know squat about evangelism. Trust me, I'm United Methodist. But you know, if if the person who is not in church, uh, let me put this another way: if if you who are in church um, and and you are fully biblically literate and you are aware, well, not fully, but you know what I mean, Leviticus. But you know, you you really have internalized Scripture and you have a testimony. You know how God has been at work in your life, shaping you to make you a less obnoxious person than the stereotypical Christian. Great book for Christians to read is, I think, Unchristian was the title of it, like, you know, the, the stereotype uh, of the Christian that really puts people off. But, but, but you are an invitation to read the Bible, in effect. Or, you know, hypothetically, one of us could be a turnoff from reading the Bible but the kind of embodiment you take with you to that person of Christian faith um, can be, and if you, if you dare even go further than that, to talk about you know, Christian faith and, and how, how God has been at work in you, it, it might make the Bible relevant for, for all the right reasons to that person. Maybe I've thrown this out too soon. Maybe I've believed the stereotypes too quickly. Why you? I was going to say why you have the mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Y'all were too fast. Um, we all have PhDs up here, but we still don't have a clue. <laughs> grab the microphone. Grab Thank the you. Mic. Okay. The uh, question. I think you've addressed this in your presentation, but you may want to expand a bit. Uh, I sure got the message, and it wasn't comfortable. Uh, the relevance of Revelation for today and parallels. And parallels? Parallels uh, to, I guess, their situation and ours. Uh, that would be my guess. All right. Um, hmm. Well, there's a whole bunch of parallels and, and ways of getting at relevance. But, but basically, you know, where are we replicating the strengths of the churches? that Christ commends in those oracular pronouncements in Revelation 2 and 3? Where are we rep replicating the mistakes of those churches? Uh, where are we getting doctrine right but love wrong? Where are we um, um, making it possible to enjoy um, the fruits of what God does not love? thinking of, of, of the Nicolaitans and the prophetess in Thyatira who you know, consider themselves fully Christian and, 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 and their big mistake was they wanted to make uh, some way for Christians to live a normal life in that society. 
you know, not a, not a terrible crime, and yet the way they were doing it made it impossible to live a bold Christian witness to that society. Where are we doing that? Um, and then, you know, what is bestial about our polity and our government? Uh, where are where are we uh, as taxpayers and voters and what have you? Uh, where are we enabling? practices of domination that do not accomplish ends that God would approve of. Uh, where are we? Uh, there was another. It was just right there on the... Uh, it's gone now. Grab the mic. <laughs> but th that, that sure. sort of thing. That sure. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, thank you, David, so much for the revelation stuff. It was very helpful. Um, I'd be curious if you'd give us two cents on how you think John's prophetic word, which is to us as well now, by extension, how that compares or contrasts with something like Augustine's City of God or even other New Testament approaches that seem to be more mm -hmm. balanced or something like, you know, don't partake, but you're still in the world, engage it, or any of the things like that. Yeah, thank you for that. That's, that's a good, it's a good question because it does invite canonical balance into the equation, for one thing. And, and uh, uh, John uh, produced what he did because uh, the, the, the political system, the ideological system in which he lived and moved and had his breathing uh, was so bad in some, in some ways and was heading in even worse directions. I mean, I'm one who says, you know, Revelation was not written because Christians were being persecuted rampantly throughout the province, but Revelation was written because living out God's claims brought you in, in conflict in a way that was increasingly leading uh, in that direction. Um, and in part, I think Revelation was written to increase martyrdom, uh, not just to comfort martyrs, but to make Christians bolder. But we don't live in that same system. Uh, we have uh, certain areas of, of freedom and toleration that, that those Christians did not enjoy. And so to that extent, other models of relating to government would, uh, would probably be more appropriate in most situations, whereas many of our sisters and brothers, uh, with whom we must learn how to relate and, and in whom we must learn how to be in community, are facing uh, far worse than John's audiences uh, were facing. Uh, so, uh, in part, I don't take maybe John's critique of government just as something to say, well, how's America doing on the scorecard? But how are all governments where the church is trying to grow doing in the scorecard? And, and where are the, the, the more dire problem areas as a call to us who have greater freedom lobbying power, resources for sharing to, uh, to reach out. Am I getting at? Yeah, so. This, thank you. This card has a question for the next three of you in order. It was preordained. Um, Mike, and this question, uh, I, I think I've got the gist of it, but the question is, how does one understand a biblical author who is outside of the text of the Bible, and, and the explanation going on is like a book like Hebrews, where the author is unknown, or Old Testament books where there's more than one author. So I guess the question would be, how do you talk about the author or have any understanding when you don't know who the author is other than mentioned in the text? Okay. Well, the King James Bible says Hebrews is by Paul, so... I'm saying it again. The King James says Hebrew is by Paul, so there we go. Problem solved. Um, yeah, it's a different one. In the case of the Old Testament books, if these books have been through some sort of editing process, um, and whether people, I mean, I think a lot of them have, but whether you can actually identify uh, different authors or layers and redactions. There's a funny story of, a, of an Irishman who was teaching in Scotland, and uh, he said, um, Now you might call me a die-in-the-wall conservative, but I believed that there was only three Isaiahs. Um, <laughs> um, it's conservative relative to where you are. 
Um, look, when it comes to the other, I think we just take them in their canonical and received form and you work from there. I think that's the best way to work. Yes, the, uh, there are questions of um, source, uh, uh, historical background and context. They are not irrelevant. But generally speaking, I think it's in the, in the received and the canonical form that we're primarily operating. So that's how I deal with those things. That's largely, I think, what Brevard Charles was doing in his canonical approach. And that, I think that works. And at the end of the day, that's, that's where the locus of meaning is going to be found. In the, in the received form, not in the preliminary forms. Uh, in the case of a book like Hebrews, well, it's true, we don't know the author. Uh, but in that case, it doesn't matter too much because the authorship doesn't seem to be imperative for understanding the text. And we can try to discern elements of the author's background, purposes, aims, and his sort of rhetorical and biblical craft, particularly the way he uses the Old Testament, to find out what his primary aim is, what his, what his context, his content, and his concern is really about. I think we can just discern independent of knowing who the author was. Thank you. All right, Jonathan, the question for you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a quiz, okay? I'm, I'm this, a little scared for some reason of this question. I this know. person says, I have found Matthew 15, 21 to 28. I found it? No, they found this helpful. Do you know what Matthew 15, 21, oh, never mind. Okay. I'll give you a hint. So it's right after the, yeah, the Syrophoenician woman. I don't, I don't remember which one. Good. That makes me feel so much better. Uh, I should know. That's, that is pretty embarrassing, actually. <laughs> yes. It's about the, uh, the uh, uh, Jesus uh, uh, encounter with a Canaanite woman. Yes. All right. Well done, well done. Uh, the, uh, as a possible example of Jesus being tempted and going and growing in his understanding of his ministry, uh, as an example of avoiding the four monocles uh, you pointed out, uh, how would you interpret this text? I, I missed how the last part is connected. The, the temptation... Uh, Okay, uh, you had said there are the, the four uh, uh, Cyclops ways of reading uh, the text. Um, how would you avoid doing that and bring interpretation to this text? Okay, what were my four things? <laughs> i got to remember those. I'm getting too old, too much uh, partying when I was a teenager. Um, let's see, so the Canaanite woman story... Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I think a lot of it would be the same as what I said about the temptation in terms of, you know, not reading it like an epistle. It's a story with its own power. Um, honestly, what else did I say? What would some help me out here, guys? Um, <laughs> the uh, what, pre-resurrection, yeah. So uh, is this what you're asking, like how to sort of do an exposition of this with, with, that, with avoiding those ways? Is that what the question is? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, you. from what I've said already, I think you can imagine, I think there are many good questions asked of that text. I've never asked the racial, well, I have kind of asked the racial one, but not quite in the same way you have. Um, many good things you could inquire about the text. What I would say is one of the most important readings that come from that text is looking in its literary co-text or its context there, because I think what happens, you have a series of stories in chapter 14 and 15 that do a number of things. I think in the first instance, they portray 
uh, a double exodus with Jesus walking on water and wilderness feeding that's repeated twice. One exodus for Jewish people, one for Gentile people, by which together, I think Matthew is arguing that there's a new people of God, Jew or Gentile, who respond to Jesus, both of which are created out of an exodus, and then that falls, all that builds up to chapter 18 with the ecclesiological discourse, the new covenant. So, so I think that's, that's part of what's going on there, but what's particularly striking is that Matthew likes to juxtapose, juxtapose opposite stories next to each other, and you have the Pharisees and the Sadducee, the Pharisees, sorry, come and religious leaders come from Jerusalem and they're upset with Jesus that they're eating with unwashed hands, which is referring interestingly to the miracle he fed all these poor people in the wilderness. They're upset that they're not eating ritually. That is then followed, I'm trying to think, I think there's one other story in there. But the, it's juxtaposed then when, and, and so they're uh, decried for having no faith and instead just being legalistic in that sense. And then she comes and serves as an example of incredible faith, even though she's outside, right? And one of the most fascinating things is, of course, there were no Canaanites in the first century. It's, it's a nice artistic touch by Matthew to call her a Canaanite woman, because that's one of the many clues. She's clearly a Syrophoenician geographically, right? Or, or socioethnically in that sense. But to call her a Canaanite woman would be like somebody today saying, I'm part of the Confederacy, right? It doesn't exist anymore, but that says something, right? Very, or having a Confederate flag. And for Matthew to call her a Canaanite woman is part of the many ways he's communicating Exodus in chapters 14 and 15, right? But then notice the irony. She is the one who has faith where the Jerusalemites are attacking Jesus for not washing their hands. So I think that's one of the most important readings of that text is to read those stories together and recognize that together they are, they are kind of making an ethnic claim or a racial claim if you want, but it's all centered in that there's the people of God are redefined in Matthew according not to ethnicity, but according to how you respond to Jesus in faith or not. So does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you. Sorry to mangle your Sorry. question there. Sue, uh, there, there's one that we could spend about three weeks on, and so um, and th this gentleman asked very good questions. But then there's another one that I think might kind of impact everything that has several of the presentations. So I'll just say the first question was about defining historical criticism, <laughs> uh, which is uh, that's a big one. Uh, how you develop uh, your understanding, you know, how can you grow in that area and apply it to a New Testament text? Do you want to take that on, or do you want to go to the next question? I can say a few things about okay. that. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> I think that, that it's a term that is loosely used. It doesn't have just one single kind of um, bullet list of, okay, this is it. Um, but it refers collectively and sort of generically to the whole set, a complex of techniques and um, presumptions and theoretical models about sources and all kinds of things that have been developed among biblical scholars over the last three centuries or so to try to look at the biblical texts um, with the benefit of reason and of secular knowledge, of a great historiographic method, uh, at attention to sources and that sort of thing. So, so to just say historical criticism, we use it as a shorthand, but it's it really depends on what techniques you're talking about in a given instance. And I think that one of the best ways to get some familiarity with sort of how it's been classically practiced is just to take one or two excellent textbooks for the New Testament, surveys or books on basic exegesis. And these bibliographies are, are not hard to find. Um, I think that the challenge then is where have we gone since then? Um, how has historical criticism um, been critiqued. And there are, again, some really great books on that. There's a great book by Dale Martin called The Pedagogy of the Bible, which I think is excellent on what are some of the benefits, but also what have, where have we seen historical criticism to be limited. Um, there's also a great one, um, I'm suddenly forgetting the name, but the, the author is, is um, Adam, uh, is A.K.M. Adam, um, on faithful Interpretation is what it's called. Great books that sort of get you thinking about hermeneutics um, and how we maybe need to 
uh, adjust some of our understandings about historical criticism. And then the, there was another right, okay. question. This, this question is addressed specifically to you, but I think maybe this could be a last question that uh, touches on several things, or you may have more. I don't know, but we'll go with this one. Uh, this is specifically for you because uh, of uh, your tradition, but uh, uh, within the context uh, that there are more there's more than one reformed tradition. Right. Right. Uh, and I think all the Presbyterians here understand that. There's, uh, you, you have one aspect of the reformed right. tradition, not the only one. Um, within that context, uh, you appear to imply that having privilege is inherently sinful. Is it not a more historically reformed position, depending on which one, I guess, uh, to rejoice and be thankful for it as God's gracious sovereign providence? in part perhaps as the residual result of the foundations of the Puritan and separatist founders. Is it necessarily slash objectively to be repented of, but rather to be valued and used in the extension of the kingdom, it being uh, privilege? Now, I don't think I'm going to answer that specifically from the reformed sense, because I'm just not up enough on what Calvin or somebody might have said about that, but I can certainly talk about privilege. I don't think, and if, I'm, if I sounded like this, it wasn't really my intention to say that we have to repent of privilege, that privilege is inherently a sin. I would rather say that privilege is um, a gift that comes with incredible responsibility. Um, and so, I mean, when I was raising my daughters, I mean, we are kind of middle class economically, but, but I've, I told them, I said, you were growing up with incredible sort of intellectual privilege because of the family they've grown up in and the kinds of things we've talked about around the dinner table, and that that is a responsibility. That, and I, I often go, my go-to verse is Jesus, uh, to whom much is given, much shall be required. So it's not that privilege is something sinful in and of itself, it's that it carries with it huge responsibility then the second piece I would say is that it carries with it enormous risk of, um, of being blind to reality as seen by those who do not have privilege. And so part of the responsibility is precisely to endeavor through various means, through listening to the voice of the poor, or those who are marginalized in other ways, uh, to uh, engaging a conversation with people whose views are different from our own, um, uh, to doing, uh, talking to people of other religions uh, or people from other countries, to uh, traveling abroad if you're, if you're able, uh, to try to uh, make up for that blind spot that privilege gives us. So again, not a sin in, inherently, but um, potentially a, a danger insofar as it can, uh, can lead to hubris and it can lead us to fail to account for all of those other people whom God loves who don't share that privilege. Uh, I, th I think we can all learn from uh, Peter Parker's uncle who said, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong. If you are, if you are b born uh, into a, a family, whether you know wherever you are, and you know your parents or your grandparents have done okay, and you're fortunate to be born in those circumstances, there's nothing wrong in that. Uh, it's what you do with your life thereafter. For example, if you are, if you then dedicate your life to maintaining your privilege and those of your peers by keeping others somewhat suppressed or preventing mobility. Um, that could be a few, that could be problematic. And uh, that, that can happen in all sorts of places and countries where the, the idea is to, you know, to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. And uh, as Christians, we're certainly not called to participate in those sort of programs. In fact, we'd protest against them. Uh, but there's, there should be no guilt incurred simply because you're fortunate enough to be involved in, in a family uh, where you know, they enjoy good health care uh, on a roof over your head. So, yeah. Anybody else? Any other burning questions? Uh, have we reached a, uh, speaking of burning, are you uh, feeling a little burned out at this point? Are we ready to stop? I, I am seeing that I think we're ready to stop. That's my discernment for the day. I want to thank all four of you for such a stimulating day and also to thank you for uh, what you bring as uh, who you are. 
Uh, this is not a dry academic uh, exercise. In every presentation, there was a sense of your own uh, uh, passion and faith commitment and uh, why this stuff matters. And that really came through. And uh, that makes a huge difference. And I'm grateful for it. And I suspect these folks are too. And uh, thank you. And again, we look forward to uh, Michael uh, preaching tomorrow. Uh, at least I do. <laughs> uh, actually, I have to preach at 8.30, Michael. Are you sure you can't do it twice? Uh, I, I was going to do a bike ride uh, before it gets dark. <laughs> that's, that's, really, uh, that's really unfair. Just kidding. Uh, and so you're certainly welcome back to this space tomorrow, 10.50 a.m., and um, we hope you'll come back other times. And we hope this conversation continues. Uh, we will have uh, uh, a recorded version of today's presentations. I don't know when, and I don't know how much it'll cost. But uh, if you have an interest, uh, just contact the church, and we'll make sure we get that to you. Thanks again to Steve Schmidt. Let's give Steve a hand today.